All right. So last time we were reviewing the nature of sex differences and their causes between species. And as we covered there, sex differences within species, as well as sex differences between species, should only be expected to emerge when males and females of the same species face different and recurrent adaptive problems. So much the same way as we should expect differences in general in species to emerge when the different species face different adaptive problems, like a predator species versus a prey species, you get different adaptations in these because they have different problems to solve. You also expect similarities when species face the same adaptive problems, like a lot of species have to process visual information, they have to see to navigate their world, and so a lot of species settle on the adaptation of eyes. And while many species do have eyes because they solve the problems related to vision, the eyes within many different species are going to differ because of the specific visual problems that that species has to solve, such as vision for light or dark environments. You need different eyes to see well when the sun's out versus when you're trying to see in the dark. And also they might have vision centers dedicated for particular objects or patterns found in the natural world. As we covered in a way earlier lecture on this front, for instance, there are bees that are able to see ultraviolet wavelengths of light that humans can't. And this is likely owing to the coevolution between bees and flowers, in this case, that they're pollinating, that the flowers are trying to attract the bees in with ultraviolet patterns on their petals, which we can't see, but the bees can. And these patterns direct the bees to where they're supposed to go to get the nectar, so the bees go in, they get a meal, and in the process, they also rummage around in the flower, get covered in sticky pollen, fly to a different flower and pollinate that. And this coevolution is well understood between the species, but because the bees are solving a visual problem that humans don't, they have different visual systems compared to humans. So while both bees and humans need to solve problems of vision, so we both have eyes, the specifics of the mechanisms of our visual systems differ when those problems differ as well. Similarly, males and females within the same species may have adaptations to solve similar problems, but they vary in the specifics of the mechanics. So let's say males and females both have adaptations related to mate preferences, which is what we're going to talk about today. Both males and females need to successfully locate mates, they need to assess their relative quality, they need to copulate, they need to raise children, and so on. But the nature of these mating preferences may or may not differ between males and females dependent on what adapt depending on what adaptive problems they faced. If those adaptive problems differ, you get sex differences. And because males and females don't always share identical methods of maximizing their reproductive fitness, we should expect sex differences to emerge both res with respect to their bodies, their physiology, and their minds, their psychology. And as we covered before, if you see a sex difference in physical traits, like a male is taller than a female, this implies the presence of psychological difference as well. Because you couldn't get a stable difference in size if you weren't getting stable recurrent differences in behavior. And what generates behavior? That's our psychology. So physical sex differences are evidence of psychological sex differences. Now there's one obvious way we can think about these mating preferences and how they differ in sex specific ways between males and females. And one of the most obvious ways is the target of that sexual attraction. So across all sex differentiated species, specifically in cases where there is a male and a female, the males show overwhelming tendencies for being sexually attracted to females relative to other males, while females show an overwhelming preference for being sexually attracted to males relative to other females. It's one of the most easily understandable adaptive preferences that exists, as male-male and female-female pairings don't produce offspring. And so you want some adaptations that are going to push people towards being attracted to those that are likely to actually allow them to reproduce. And those that were indifferent as to the sex of their mating partners are less likely to reproduce as to those who care about the 
sex of their mating partners. If you had one hypothetical group and they didn't really care whether they were mated with males or females, and you had another group that did care, it's not easy, or rather it's not hard to see, why the ones that care probably outreproduce the ones that don't. And of course, that's not to say that same-sex attraction doesn't exist. It does, and we can discuss the reasons for why those preferences exist later, but I just wanted to start off by noting this abundantly clear and robust sex difference in psychology. By and large, the vast, vast, vast majority of males are almost or actually exclusively attracted to females, and the vast, 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 vast majority of females are attracted to or exclusively or almost exclusively to males when it comes to sex. Now, there's another major domain where the sexes tend to differ in the adaptive problems they face, and we saw this last time, and this is with respect to the amount of required versus the amount of optional parental investment that they must provide if they're going to seriously reproduce. So when one sex, be it male or female, provides a greater degree of parental investment in offspring than the others, the one that's providing more care tends to become more selective in their mating preferences. In humans, that typically means that females are the more selective sex when it comes to their mating preferences relative to males, because females are the ones that are providing far more required, or in fancy terms, obligate parental investment. So in humans, an investment of three minutes of mating effort by a male can result in three or more years of parental investment by a female, if you look at it in terms of its absolute minimum investments. And given these incredibly steep and unequal costs when it comes to producing and raising and protecting and provisioning offspring, we have very fertile grounds for sex differences to emerge between men and women, both with respect to their bodies and with respect to their minds. And we also saw that there are species where this parental investment is reversed, where the males actually do provide more investment than the females. The principle holds, and it's the males that all of a sudden become more selective. It's the females that tend to become larger and showier and more aggressive and compete for the male's attention more readily. And so it's not sex per se that determines what type of sex difference you're going to see. It's not that females are always smaller than males or females are always more selective than males. It has to do with how much these sexes are investing in parental effort. The sex that's investing more tends to be more selective and the sex that's investing less tends to be less selective. So we can really appreciate how the mating psychology and our bodies reflect solutions to these underlying adaptive problems. Now, it's also the case here that in all mammalian species, when it comes to reproducing, the largest rate limiter in terms of how many offspring you can actually produce for males tends to be the number of available female partners. That is, if you want to determine how many offspring a male is going to have, what you need to know is how many female partners does that male have. The more female partners they have, the more offspring they're going to have, all else being equal. By way of historical example here, while numbers on record holders for people who have had the most offspring, they can be less than perfectly accurate. One of the most prolific men on record when it comes to their direct reproduction at least number of offspring credited to this man, was a Moroccan sultan by the name of, and I hope I don't get this name too wrong, Ismail Ibn Sharif. And this particular individual was estimated to have fathered approximately a thousand children. I saw some estimates about 800 and I saw a little above a thousand as well. So let's split the difference and say about a thousand children. And it's been reported that this impressive feat of reproduction was achieved because this sultan had access to several wives, several hundred concubines, and it's also been reported that he had a series of eunuchs that were going to accompany these concubines so they couldn't mate with them. 
and they would prevent other people from mating them. And any concubine that strayed, or any wife that strayed, would be severely punished, and any man that tried to encroach on his mates would be severely punished. And to give you a sense for this degree of punishment, this person's title, historical title, is the bloodthirsty. So I'm going to let your imagination fill in the rest as to exactly how this person was able to achieve this level of reproductive success. It's also, of course, estimated that Genghis Khan had this person beat by quite a margin, but as I don't know any specific numbers as to how many offspring Genghis Khan left behind, it's not particularly well recorded. We'll just say the most prolific man on record had about a thousand direct offspring. Genghis Khan, by the way, also incredibly reproductively active, also incredibly violent. Interesting connection there. By contrast, the most prolific woman I was able to come across was a Russian woman by the name of Valentina Vasilyeva, I think? I'm not sure how to pronounce this one either. But Valentina, we'll say. And she is rumored to have given birth to 69 children. And this impressive, unusually high number is largely owing to her peculiar tendency for giving birth to twins, triplets, and quadruplets. And since this tendency is not particularly common among women, most women do not give birth to twins, triplets, or beyond with any regularity, we might instead think about the number of pregnancies which she is reported to have, which is 27. And so, let's just take that rounded up to 30. And that's about the maximum realiz realized reproductive rate for a human female. So even though these are very extreme examples, just comparing the numbers, if you want to say the most prolific woman produced about 30 children because of 30 pregnancies, or about 70 children because she gave birth to twins, triplets, and quadruplets, it doesn't really make too much of a difference because you're comparing 30 or 70 children to the upper limit of male reproductive success, which is said to have broken a thousand. And we've also saw very similar examples of this last time in elephant seals, where you have a very small percentage of the males, maybe about 5% of the males, that tend to father the vast majority of the offspring every generation, about 85% of them, it's been said. And of course, if you have 5% of the males that are producing 85% of the offspring, well, this means most males are left without the ability to mate at all, and they produce no offspring. So you get a much larger degree of reproductive variation in males, as well as higher upper ceilings. But of course, this isn't the only pattern of parental investment that we might see. That is, not every male out there is Genghis Khan. Sometimes both males and females do provide parental care for the offspring. Human males, for instance, often provide parental investment that goes well above and beyond what's minimally required. This is very unusual for a lot of mammals. So mating in human contexts occurs both in long-term and short-term environments. And this is also seen in other species as well. We're not unique in this. But there is variation in terms of human mating and parental investment strategies. So in these long-term contexts where males do end up providing substantial parental investment, we might expect that the males are going to become more selective in their partners. That is, if I'm going to have a casual encounter with a woman and I'm not going to invest in her offspring afterwards, I'm going to be more permissive in terms of what woman I might be interested in mating with, whereas if I'm expected to spend the rest of my life with this person and help raise children, now my standards for what I want in a partner are probably going to go up because I'm investing more, and so I want to get more out of it. And we saw some data bearing on this in the Clark and Hatfield study we reviewed. And this is where a research confederate, someone working for the research, approaches a random stranger around campus and propositions them for either basically going on a date or having casual sex. And we saw that if you're approached by a woman 
and you're asked for a date as a man, you're more likely to become selective. About 50% of men said, yes, I'll go on a date with you, compared to if a woman just approaches you and asks for casual sex. In that case, about 85% of the men said yes, and the ones that said no said, I would love to, but can we reschedule, or I'm flattered, but I have a girlfriend. So when men are being approached for just casual sex, their standards appear to go down. Whereas when they're propositioned for dates where they might be investing, their standards tend to go up. Whether you're talking about long or short-term mating, this is going to affect our mating psychology quite a bit. And conversely, we also saw the reverse happen in females. That is, in women that were approached, they tended to be, again, about 50% agreeable to a date, but 0% agreeable to casual sex. In a short-term context, it looks like women's standards went up if they were only going to be receiving the sex, whereas if they were going to be receiving some investment, their standards appeared to decline a bit. So we should expect, of course, that women occasionally, at least engaged in short and long-term mating, as well as men did, otherwise we wouldn't have different preferences for short and long-term mating. And depending on whether females are anticipating receiving parental investment or not, their preferences in mates appear to shift. Male and female psychological mating preferences depend heavily on context. And the context under which this mate selection takes place is really vitally important to understand, as no species, including our own, ever selects mates just at random. Random selection of mates would just be catastrophic for reproductive fitness. Which is why selection appears to have shaped and maintained a variety of psychological mechanisms for solving specific problems related to mating. And this is because there are far more ways of selecting inappropriate sexual partners or behaving in non-adaptive ways in the mating domain than there are of selecting appropriate partners or making good choices. That it's so selection should be expected to have shaped our mate preferences in much the same way it would shape our preferences for food, the exact same reason. There are far fewer ways of eating things which are nutritious and not poisonous compared to eating things that won't give you nutritional value or will actually kill you. We don't pick food at random and we don't pick mates at random. And we seem to have dedicated mechanisms for attracting mates, for selecting them from available options, for retaining partners, for replacing them in case they leave, for deterring rivals, for encroaching on your mates, and shifting our preferences based on the world that we find ourselves in. Am I highly desirable? Am I not highly desirable? Am I a man? Am I a woman? What problems am I gonna to have to solve? We shift our preferences based on these contexts as well, because these are all crucial adaptive problems related to successful mating and reproduction. And mating and reproduction, of course, is the entire the motivation, metaphorical motivation, behind the evolutionary process. It's the causal outcome. So, as is the case with many other psychological mechanisms that we've reviewed so far, the inner workings of our mating psychology, that is, the reasons for their existence, what problems they solve, what inputs they use, and what outputs they generate, their functioning doesn't necessarily reach conscious awareness. We don't need to know that we're solving these problems or why we like what we like within the mating domain. We just need to know what we like. All we need are the outputs of all these different mechanisms working on these problems of attracting a mate and retaining them and replacing them and so on. All we need are the outputs. We don't have access to the inner workings of why we like what we like. And because our preferences in this domain dramatically affect our personal happiness and the personal happiness and comfort of lots of other people, we would be pretty well served in coming to understand these preferences and why they exist and what they are and what people want and why they want it. It puts you in a much better position to solve these problems yourself and to understand what you're facing and why you're facing it. In other words, to help navigate this very confusing world of mating. So with that in mind, 
Let's turn to the matter of what humans tend to look for in their relationships and think about why they look for these things. We want to know what about men are valued by women and what things about women are valued by men. What are these traits that we tend to prefer and why? Now, it's important to note at the outset of this discussion that we're going to be talking about general patterns that you see in males and females. As all mate choice, as we just covered, is made in very context-specific ways, individualized based on your current situation, there are always going to be differences that arise from person to person from these general patterns. People are not statistics. Nevertheless, since the general patterns that we are going to discuss, that we do see, tend to be so consistent and so robust across time and place, it's really important to know about them if you're looking to understand mating decisions made by others and guide your own behavior appropriately. So the work we're going to talk about today comes largely from David Buss, pictured here, who happens to be an evolutionary psychologist that's done the most extensive study of mate preferences I've ever seen. Specifically, a lot of what we're going to cover comes from his major study, which involved men and women from 37 different cultures on six continents, five islands, across a variety of races, ethnic groups, ages, educational backgrounds, religions, political systems, and included over 10,000 people, as well as some research findings from his dozens of follow-up studies throughout the years, which have been one of the most thorough examinations of something I've ever seen in the psychological literature, frankly. His work is truly impressive. So, we can start with what women report they value in a long-term male partner. In making their mating decisions, human females are going to be saddled with far higher costs and risks for their decisions than men are. And this is because of the way pregnancy works. Because the consequences of women's mating decisions extends far further into the future than men's, we should expect that women are both more selective than men are, and that they have a keener eye towards both present and future characteristics of their partner. That is, you, women don't necessarily need to know just who is an attractive partner right now. They might also want to know who is an attractive partner five years into the future because the involvement of that partner is probably going to extend that long, and if it doesn't, she's going to be saddled with lots of future costs. So women need to know how valuable are the things that the partner offers presently, how valuable are the things the partner is going to offer in the future, and she should have a very keen eye and be selective for this because there are major costs to making a bad decision. And further, the parental investment that's offered by men is a variable and valuable resource. So what women are probably going to look for are traits that correspond or correlate to the ability of their partner to invest as a parent in a relationship. And one major axis here, of course, that everyone knows about, is economic capacity. Now, when I say economic capacity, I don't just mean money, because money was not really a feature of our evolutionary history as a species. But I'm talking more about access to resources, physical, obtainable, defendable resources. A prospective partner's access to these valuable resources is really what we're trying to get at. Because not all people have access to the same resources, whether those resources are physical in nature or social. And a partner who lacks access to valuable resources, regardless of their willingness to invest them in a woman, is physically going to be able to invest less. You cannot invest what you don't have. So a partner who has fewer resources is, of course, going to be a bit more questionable. Put in a very simple modern example, if you have a male and they have no money, they can't provide any prospective partners with a meal whereas someone who does have ample access to cash is capable of providing such a benefit. 
And you can say that same thing about territory, housing perhaps in modern examples, shelter, tools, skill sets they offer, social groups they can pull you into, a variety of resources that are very, very relevant for survival and protection and provisioning. So to the extent that women are receiving investment from their partner, they should find partners capable of providing that investment more attractive than those who are incapable of doing so. And indeed they do. Across time and place, research on this topic has very consistently revealed that women place a much higher premium on the economic capacities of their partner than men do. With women rating the economic capacities of their partner about twice as important on average. That is, in none of the cultures across any time has it been revealed where you have men who value women's economic capacity more than women value that in men. Women always want a partner who has more economic resources relative to men. It's a very stable sex difference. But of course, there's more to investment than current physical resources. There's also access to future resources. Are you going to have access to resources in the future, whether those are physical or social resources? And women consider this as well. That is, women also express a much stronger preference for the social status of their male partners. As you might say, women are inclined to try and marry up a lot more than men are. Specifically here, women tend to look for men who command the respect of others, who have better access to social networks, who are better educated, who are more successful in professional domains, and all of these things are valued because they tend to correlate with present and future access to resources. And we don't have examples of cultures where men are predominantly looking to marry rich women, marry women of high status, and be provided for them. It's almost exclusively the reverse of that. And there are other traits associated with men that can correlate with access to these important resources. And age is one such factor. Where older men, generally speaking, tend to have better access to resources than younger ones. As men get older, they tend to have better jobs, they tend to have more money, they tend to have better social status, they tend to achieve more professionally, they learn more. As men get older, they tend to command more resources the world over. And as such, we also universally find that women prefer partners that are a couple of years older than them, usually about three to four years on average, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but the pattern is always women tend to like older partners and men tend to prefer younger. Now, as for why women prefer older men, but only by about a couple of years, that's something we do have to think about a little more. It's likely due to several factors. That is, women don't just desire the oldest men. They desire men that are a little older than them. So why not? Why don't women just value the oldest men? And part of the reason for this is that access to resources and social status does not universally improve with age. So one simple reason is death, obviously. Old, and specifically very old people, are simply more likely to die than younger ones at any given time. And if your partner is very old, and their risk of death is very high, you risk losing access to all the resources they previously provided when they die. Similarly, with advanced age, you can also see some declines in physical and mental performance across pretty much every domain, which can also leave very old individuals less well positioned to provide for their partners. That is, they may start to decline in social status and access to resources as they get very old. And then, of course, there's another major issue, which is if you go for a very large age gap, 
like I'm sure you've seen some pictures of a 20 year old woman that marries an 80 year old partner. Compatibility as the age gap grows probably declines quite a bit as well. And as we'll cover later, compatibility is another very important factor in these relationships. So age is somewhat complicated as a factor, but generally as men do get older, they tend to command more resources, more social status, and this makes them more desirable as they are more capable of investing in offspring. Now there are, of course, some cases, and I'm sure you've heard of these, where women, older women, start pairing up with younger men. I believe one of the more modern terms for this was cougars. And why this happens is, of course, another very interesting question. One possible explanation, of course, on this front is that as women get older, and we'll cover this in the male section as well, they tend to become less desirable as mating partners with age. Women's desirability tends to decline as they get older. And so older women, in some instances, may start selecting younger partners because these younger partners are effectively all they can get. That is, younger men tend to be less desirable than older men, and older women tend to be less desirable than younger women. And so the less desirable and less desirable categories can start matching up because they are the ones that are available to each other. So that is, if you think about this, older women mating with younger men, occasional phenomenon which you see floating around, this might not actually represent a reversal of preferences. That is, the older women may actually want to be with older partners. That might be their preference, but rather it represents a compromise between what they want and what they can get. We'll talk about that in a bit as well. But further, going on, if you're thinking about what traits are going to signal access to resources, both now and in the future, one of the best cues to success that you can use are to look at psychological factors. A bit harder to assess, but very valuable. Specifically, you might want to think about the psychological factors of ambition and industriousness. Ambition corresponds roughly to how much someone wants to get ahead in life, and industrious corresponds roughly to how much work someone's willing to put in to get ahead in life. So those who have a greater desire to command resources and social networks with higher ambition and those who put more time into achieving those goals should ultimately be expected to succeed more now and in the future than people who aren't ambitious and aren't hardworking. So if women are trying to assess who's gonna make a good long-term partner, not just who has access to resources right now, but who is likely to have access to resources also several years in the future, it should come as no surprise that women tend to value traits like ambition and industriousness more than men do. Men tend to view these in a partner as more of a neutral thing. If I have a partner who's ambitious and hardworking, great. If I have a partner who's not that ambitious and isn't that hardworking, I mean, whatever, it's fine. That's kind of the level men tend to be at. Whereas women tend to rate things like ambition and industriousness as more, not only just important, but indispensable in a partner. They're really looking for someone who's going to work and work hard and want to do it. So put bluntly, there's no culture in the world where women view men that lay around all day and do nothing and have no desires to achieve things in life as objects of their desire. Women do not, in any culture and any time in the world, look at lazy men as attractive. These men would signal poor future prospects and likely current poor prospects because of their inaction, their unwillingness to go out and achieve, and they would be bad social investments. 
in addition, it's not just about having resources, but you also have to consistently provide them to a partner. That is, being willing to consistently provide benefits should prove an attractive trait in a partner, no matter what those benefits are, men or women. As such, it may come as no surprise that both men and women rate things like love and dependable characters and emotional stability as being extremely important for long-term relationships. In this regard, men and women do tend to agree. And in many parts of the world, men and women place equal weights on these things, given how they're likely to influence the behavior of a partner and produce satisfying relationships. Emotionally in unstable people are less reliable, less dependable, less likely to provide these benefits, more likely to provide costs. So men and women both want to avoid emotionally unstable people. However, when a sex difference does exist, it almost universally exists where women value these traits more than men. So both men and women do value these. When there is a sex difference, it tends to be women value things like emotional stability and dependable characteristics more than men in long-term relationships. And emotional stability, uh, rather emotional instability, and a lack of dependability are both strong signals that a partner may not invest in your relationship as much, they may not invest when it's most important to invest, it can lead to inconsistency in the predictability of their investment and the ability of someone to access important resources, which of course can be very meaningful if you need food now and this is the moment your partner chose to have a breakdown and not provide it. The consistency is very important. These factors of emotional instability and a lack of dependability can work together not only to compromise the flow of benefits, but it can also lead partners to actively inflict costs, such as emotionally unstable partners being more jealous, more physically violent. These are things that you want to avoid in a long-term partner. You want to avoid the costs, you want to get the benefits. And on this note, while intelligence is something of a nebulous concept in terms of what it precisely means to be smart, definitions of this vary quite a bit, it's nevertheless a trait that both men and women value highly in their partner. Both men and women want intelligent partners. Because intelligence likely corresponds to a more general ability to solve all sorts of important tasks in life effectively. So like emotional stability and like dependability, where a sex difference does exist for intelligence, it tends to be women that value intelligence more in their partner than men value it in theirs. And likely for the same set of reasons. More intelligent partners are more likely to consistently be able and willing to deliver benefits to you that are important in the relationship. So in addition to desiring traits that signal the ability to provide resources, as in having a lot of stuff, and being ambitious enough to have more stuff in the future, as well as valuing a willingness to provision, I have stuff and I'm willing to give it to you, women also tend to try, find traits that signal the ability to protect attractive as well. I've mentioned a lot in the past protection and provisioning of offspring this is a very similar category. So on that front, cues to physical prowess, including things like size, strength, and athleticism, are also traits that women tend to rate highly in their partners. It is indeed the case that women do tend to prefer taller men to shorter men, stronger men to weaker men, and height is regularly listed as an extremely desirable characteristic in a potential partner. And this, of course, makes a lot of sense because even if I do have a lot of stuff, even if I could have access to a lot of resources, it doesn't do your partner that many favors if at any point the bigger person can just come over and take them away. You need to be able to both provide the resources and protect against encroachment 
from outside forces. And indeed, it should really come as no surprise that men who do possess all these characteristics that women value in very high quantities, like professional sports players, who are often tall, strong, athletic, rich, ambitious, hard workers, are regularly sought after as mating partners. In one famous account, you have the Magic, uh, Magic Johnson, the basketball player that you see here. He reported over several years that he would have approximately 300 different sexual partners each year, demonstrating the, these preferences in action. By contrast, of course, you don't usually see that men preferentially seek out female partners that are tall and strong and athletic because these aren't the, prop, the adaptive problems that men are trying to solve in their partners. And so you see this robust sex difference in terms of preferences for things like height and physical strength. On the topic of physical traits, there is also one that both men and women tend to agree on is important in a long-term partner, which are signs of physical health or the absence of signals of poor health. Unhealthy or sickly partners are more like are they're more likely to be unable to provide important resources, take care of daily tasks. They have increased risks of disability or death, which of course can be very bad for long-term prospects. They can require greater investments of time or energy on your front to ensure they are taken care of if they are not doing well. And depending on the nature of the illness. They can also pass things on to their partner. That is, there's no country in the world where people with sexually transmitted diseases are viewed as more attractive than those who don't have them. And further, if you're in particularly ill health, habitually, because of something genetic, this is something you might be able to pass on to your future children. So if you have a, perhaps a particularly poorly functioning immune system, and that's the reason you're sick all the time, this should prove to be an unattractive trait in a long-term partner because those can also be passed on to your offspring. On top of, of course, requiring investment in the present and maybe not being able to provide investment yourself because of your ill health. So in no culture in the world, do people prefer or desire partners that show signs of being in poor health or condition. And we saw examples of this in other species. We were talking about the peacocks before. Those long trains of peacock tail feathers exist because they can signal the bird's condition honestly. A male peacock that's not in good health will not have a good looking tail, will not be able to survive with that, and so won't have something to show off to the females. So across all species, not just humans, of course, Females are going to prefer signs of good health and good genes. And one interesting possible signal of good health here, outside of obvious ones like I have no open sores, one interesting signal of health appears to be symmetry in appearance. That many animals are what we call bilaterally symmetrical, which means the right half of your body resembles the left half of your body. They should look pretty much the same. Barring some internal organs, like we only have one heart, externally we're supposed to be bilaterally symmetrical. If you cut someone down the middle, the right side's supposed to look like the left. And when individuals suffer environmental or genetic insults, things like infections, physical damage, genetic deformities or mutations, these tend to create deviations in the symmetry of your body and your face. So it follows then that the more symmetrical someone is, the greater their resilience likely was to these developmental insults or stressors. And as such, symmetry might actually be a really good sign to health and fitness in some regards. Not just in the current partner, but in their future offspring. Now, before continuing on, with other additional preferences that David Buss's research here uncovered, I wanted to take a quick aside as to why I always recommend that all people, but most especially men, exercise on a daily basis. And that's because this behavior, exercising, 
can help you fulfill the preferences of others across social and mating domains. This can in turn make you valuable and desirable to others, which positively impacts your view of yourself and your personal satisfaction in life. It's one of the best things you can do for yourself. And if you think about what we've covered today so far, these traits that women are reporting valuing in a long-term partner, we see size, strength, athleticism, signs of health and vitality, dependability, ambition, industriousness. These things are all being rated rather highly, physical and psychological characteristics. And if you think about what going to the gym or engaging in other rigorous exercise behaviors regularly entails and what that exercise results in, we can really appreciate how exercise does improve things like your size, your strength, your athleticism. It can make you healthier. It can make you look better. It can make you feel better, more energetic, which in turn gives off cues of being in good health. And because you're able to get to the gym every day and do this hard work, this signals your dependability. This signals your ambition to improve, your industriousness, your capacity and willingness to work. And these are all things that women are going to value very highly in a partner. And it can even help, this exercise can even help you improve in other aspects of your life. Because once you see how this physical activity will help you get stronger and change and grow and improve and how you learn to stick to this routine and do things that are hard consistently and get better because of it, this can potentially bleed over into other aspects of your personality and make you perhaps more resilient and more dependable in other aspects of your life as well. So if you're really looking to improve your value in the mating domain, there are few tools that are more consistently successful than regular and rigorous exercise, and this focus on self-improvement, it's gonna do you a lot of good. So, moving forward. It should also come as no surprise, we covered this before briefly, that both men and women rate the importance of love in a long-term relationship as being of paramount importance, the most important thing in a relationship. Across the world, and across time, love is consistently rated among, if not the very most important feature in a relationship. And indeed, this has been the case where if you ask women, if you have a prospective long-term partner and they have every trait that you want them to have, they're tall, they're strong, they're athletic, they're rich, they're ambitious, they're hard workers, every, they're healthy, everything that you want but they don't love you, would you want to be in a relationship with this person? And as it turns out, for many, many women, if the love wasn't there, all the other traits would not be important enough. Love is rated as the most important trait. Not to say you don't want the other stuff, but love is definitely on the top of that list. And the importance of this love can really be understood as a commitment mechanism, a psychological commitment mechanism. That is, while women might desire a great many things from their mating partners, like investment and protection, their partner merely having the ability to provide these things doesn't necessarily mean the partner is willing to invest those things, both now and in the future. A partner that did not love a woman is less likely to remain sexually faithful to her, is less likely to not divert his resources to other endeavors. That is, maybe other women, children, friends, social networks, what have you. And the person that doesn't love her may not remain a stable source of investment in the future if things change or become difficult. A relationship without love is unlikely to be a happy or a stable one, and so finding a partner that genuinely feels love for you is an adaptive problem that both men and women are going to face. <coughs> now love, like many of the other personality traits and psychological traits we've been discussing so far, is very difficult to directly observe. And this is why the displays of love, when you think about what people in love do, 
This is why the displays of love often end up so costly. As you'll recall from our previous lecture about signaling, in order to ensure the credibility of a signal, the believability of a signal, it has to be hard to fake. Because it's very easy for someone to just say, I love you. The mere act of saying it is not enough to make it convincing. Now, that's not to say that saying I love you to a partner isn't important. It's usually very important. But merely to say that it's not enough. It should also be accompanied by behaviors, which are hard to fake. Things people who are not in love would be less willing to do. And these include things like providing expensive gifts to other people, spending a lot of time around them and only them, investing in them specifically. Things that would be very difficult to fake if you didn't truly care for that person. And it's this precise reason that things like engagement rings and weddings are often as pricey as they are. That is, the priciness, the costliness of these engagement rings are a signal of a willingness to invest in a more honest fashion. If a man really didn't want to be with a woman, he would be far less likely to spend a lot of money on an engagement ring for her. It's easy for pretty much any man to provide a cheap piece of jewelry, but not so much for them to spend two to three months worth of their salary on an engagement ring, which apparently two to three months of your salary on an engagement ring is what some guides to buying them suggest you spend on them. The cost here is so ludicrously high as a suggested value because only people so stricken by love would be willing to pay it. It seems insane because it is. And so someone who wasn't truly head over heels would be unwilling to invest that much. And similarly, it's not just money, but it's investments of time and energy that are incredibly important as well. That is wanting to spend time with a partner away from others and away from distractions can be such a positive, powerful signal of your interest in them. That is, imagine what kind of signal of love you send, for instance, if you're with your partner and you spend all your time with them and you're looking at them while you're together and you're doing things together and you're talking about the same things and showing a genuine interest in each other's conversations. Think about what signal that sends compared to being with your partner and you're diverting your attention a lot. You're looking at your phone. You're not really listening to what they're saying. You're not really looking at them or paying attention to the things they're doing. These send two extremely different signals. And if you want to send very strong signals of love, you want to do the things that show you are genuinely interested in your long-term partner and not distracting your time, money, or attention into other things when you're supposed to be with them. Now, related to love, kindness is also consistently rated as a very desirable characteristic in a partner for both men and women worldwide. Both men and women want partners that are kind as a long-term partner. And because much like love, kindness can signal this willingness to invest in others at the expense of engaging in other selfish behaviors across a wide number of domains. Both women and men desire kindness from their partners, preferring them to behave kindly towards them, hold their needs in high regard, take care of what needs to be taken care of, avoiding infidelities or failing to provide important resources. Kindness is valuable to everybody in a long-term partner. Now this, I want to bring it up because it clashes with some folk wisdom that's been passed along by many people, which is that women are drawn to jerks or assholes or bad boys, that women like to be mistreated. That, that's a bit of folk knowledge that's rolled around. In other words, people are saying women don't value kindness, and this isn't the case at all. The research very clearly demonstrates this. Just as men aren't drawn to women who treat them poorly, women don't tend to be drawn to men who treat them poorly. So there are men that are sometimes desirable to women, and they're not particularly kind to them. 
And some people from this have inferred that women are interested in jerks and assholes and bad boys in being mistreated. Again, not the case at all. The reason that bad boys might have this type of reputation is that they tend to be attractive in spite of their unkind nature, not attractive because of it. This is a very important point to bear in mind. That is, that you might have a man who's particularly desirable because he possesses a wide range of positive traits, positive characteristics. He might be attractive, he might be tall, he might be strong, he might be rich. He might be desirable for all of these reasons. And because he is so desirable, he might be able to get away with more. He might be able to behave more selfishly and still hold on to his relationship because of those other positive traits. But it's not because of the unkind traits that they are attractive. Quite the opposite. Perhaps it's the case that there are too many people that conflate kindness with weakness. But these two traits are substantially different. Just bear in mind, it's not that women are attracted to unkind men. They are not. It's merely the case that people can remain attractive in spite of their unkind nature if they have a lot else going for them. Just like someone doesn't necessarily need to be rich to be attractive if they have a lot of other positive traits. We are a collection of many, many, many different traits, and you have to weigh the costs and benefits of them both now and in the future. So just bear that in mind. As much of our discussion to this point so far has focused on the ability and willingness of a partner to invest in a woman and how these are important in terms of how desirable someone ends up being, it should of course come as little surprise that a willingness to invest in children is usually a very attractive quality that women value in a partner. That is, you have one study by researcher Peggy Lacerra, and she showed women pictures of the same men engaged in a variety of different behaviors in different contexts, and asked them to rate, asked the women to rate the pictures of the men for how attractive they were as a long-term partner. So they, remember these are the same men, the man's either standing alone, he's interacting positively with a child, he's ignoring a crying child, he's just facing forward, not doing much, or he's vacuuming a rug. And when it came to women's ratings of these men, as their desirable, as their, in terms of their desirability as a long-term partner, those that were interacting positively with children were rated as being very attractive marriage partners compared to the same men not doing this. Now, notably, the same effect did not hold for men. That is, men weren't rating women interacting positively with children as more or less attractive. Men were kind of indifferent to this, but women paid particularly close attention to how a man interacted with a child. Now, this absolutely does not mean that a man with an existing child from a previous relationship is going to be a more attractive partner. As with everything, of course, context matters, and men with children from previous relationships are often viewed accurately as representing a cost rather than a benefit, because a father is likely to invest in their offspring, and if this offspring comes from a different relationship, that's someone investing in a genetic stranger compared to someone investing in your own offspring. So, women are interested in men that are favorably inclined towards investing in children, but that doesn't necessarily mean men that have children are more attractive. Just bear that differentiation in mind. Now, outside of demonstrating a positive interest in taking care of children, there's actually a very interesting signal that a man might send to make himself appear more attractive in this realm, which is to take care of a pet. As was noted by a 2015 paper by Gray and colleagues, 
Pets are often viewed by humans as a form of extended family. A lot of people will refer to pets as if they were children. They will talk to their pets in baby language as if they are talking to a child. Pets appear to tap into a lot of our psychological parenting mechanisms. And so the way you behave towards a pet can actually be informative as to the way you might behave towards a future child. In a sense, pet ownership is a somewhat honest signal of your willingness and ability to invest in children, which you can also separate from actually having children that you need to invest in. So what they did is they actually surveyed about 2,000 single match.com users, dating site, and they found that women, more than men, reported being attracted to someone because they had a pet, and men, conversely, reported being more likely to have used a pet to land dates. Women were also more likely to judge prospective partners on how her pet reacted to the man and how the man reacted to her pet. Women were more keen on that observation than men were about how a woman interacted with their pet and how their pet interacted with a woman. Women were also less likely to be interested in dating men who reported they didn't like pets. And they were more likely to say that a man posting a picture with a pet was a turn on. So pets can actually prove an interesting hypothetical case for how much is this person willing to invest in offspring. And finally, no discussion on preferences would be complete without discussing compatibility. As it turns out, opposites do not attract. Another bit of folk wisdom you can do away with. Similarities make people more attractive. Relationships that involve more similar partners tend to be initiated more often and last longer than those that contain large divergences in personalities and beliefs. Both men and women expressed a keen interest in partners who share their goals, levels of intelligence, personality, and so on. Compatibility is very important. And there are two general possible functions for this compatibility preference. First, and most obviously, dissimilar people with dissimilar interests and values tends to breed conflicts and disagreements and unrest in social relationships. Disagreements tend to hinder, hinder the pursuit of coordinated goals and behaviors and this gets in the way of you achieving any number of things. And sometimes these conflicts can extend into social circles. If your social circles are rife with disagreement, it can be hard to get your friends to come together to help out when they need to. Dissimilarity does not breed attraction. However, there's another aspect to this compatibility preference which is that pursuing other similar individuals is going to be more successful in a long-term relationship. To put this in very simple terms, if you think of people as attractive from one to 10, if someone is a five and that five is trying to pursue a 10, the 10 probably has better options. And this means whatever time and energy the five is spending pursuing the 10, is probably going to be wasted because they're not even going to initiate a relationship in the first place. Similarly, even if they do initiate that relationship, if the five gets very lucky and the 10 starts a relationship with them, this relationship may not last very long because again, the 10 is gonna tend to have better options and better available choices throughout life. So the relationships may end sooner as well when there are these large divergences in desirability. So if you want to have a more stable, long-lasting relationship, pursuing compatibility is good, not just on the level of reducing conflicts, but in actually trying to pursue people that are willing to be with you and willing to stay with you. And there can be a very dark side to this preference for similarity as well. For example, if you have one partner in a relationship, let's say you have two fives together, just to keep things simple, and one of these people starts to engage in self-improvement behaviors. This person, let's say, starts going to the gym a lot. So they're doing physical improvement. 
Maybe they get a large raise at work. Maybe they start learning lots of new skills. They become more desirable. It's not uncommon to see the other partner in this relationship who is not improving actively try to undermine their partner, actively try to impede their success, try to get them to stop getting better. Because if one partner starts improving, if this five all of a sudden improves to an eight, this threatens the stability of the relationship. Because now you had two fives that were dating, which has now become an eight dating a five, this eight is all of a sudden opening up their doors. They're getting better options and they are perhaps more likely to abandon the relationship. So keep an eye out for this, of course, in your own relationships where you don't want this compatibility to get in the way of self-improvement, especially mutual self-improvement. Now, with all these findings that we've been discussing from all these people in all these different cultures across decades of research, we have a pretty good sense as for what women in general are reporting that they desire in a long-term partner. And we're noting where some sex differences appear to reliably exist in terms of these preferences. While we have reviewed parental investment theory as a possible explanation for these differences, there are, of course, also plenty of other possible explanations for them. That is, maybe there's something else across time and across place that has existed and caused these differences in psychology between men and women and has been stable enough to maintain them for a very long time. Maybe there's an alternative explanation for all this. Now, before we get into what this possible alternative explanation would be, we do want to note that parental investment theory explains differences in behavior and bodies across every species. And so that probably explains it in humans too. But maybe there are other things present in human species that can cause or magnify these differences. And one such explanation that people have put forth is that the reason that women report desiring the things they do, specifically all these correlates of resource acquisition and investment and protection, the reason they propose that women value these things is because, broadly speaking, of universal systems of oppression that have existed over time and place which have precluded women from having access to resources reliably. That is, women might be de desiring partners that have money because the women haven't had access to money. And that's why they're looking for it. So to test this hypothesis, what people have done is they look at what happens when women do have access to resources, especially in abundance. That is, when women make more money, when women are better educated, when women have more social power, do their standards and desires for partners change? And indeed, as it turns out, they do. That is, when women start to command more resources and more power, their preferences actually do shift. Specifically, women that command more resources in their lives tend to look for similar things as women that command less resources, but their standards go up. High earners value the same type of traits that low earners do, but the high earners want way more of it. So that is, well-educated women put an even higher emphasis on their partner's educational status than low-educated women. Women who earn a lot of money place an even higher value on the earning of their potential partner. Those women who have access to substantial social resources, economic or otherwise, tend to also value things like height and confidence even higher in potential partners. So if you put this in a simple hypothetical example, a woman who has no money, no income, she might be perfectly happy with a partner who earns $50,000 a year. But now if that woman were to start earning $50,000 a year herself, she might want a partner who earns $100,000. She may no longer be as satisfied or satisfied at all with the person who earns as much or certainly less than her. And if that woman then begins to make $100,000, she might not be happy with the partner that makes $100,000 anymore. She might want the partner that makes $500,000 and so on and so on. 
Now, while this finding does directly contradict the idea that women are only seeking resources in a partner because they personally lack them, these findings do make more sense in light of the fact that women who have ample access to resources are simply in a better position to actively fulfill any of their resources and any of their preferences in life, rather. Think about it this way. We all have preferences. I have preferences. You have preferences. Everyone in the world has preferences. We like certain kinds of homes, clothing, food, entertainment, social interaction, people. We like some of these things more than we like others. Everyone's got preferences. Not everything we might pursue is equally attractive to us. I imagine most people would rather have a large, comfortable, spacious, well-heated home to a shack that was falling over and has no plumbing. We would prefer nice, soft, well-put-together clothing to rags that are falling off of our body. Preferences for everything. However, life constrains these preferences. Not everyone has enough money for the perfect house. Not everyone can date the most attractive partners. We come with limited budgets, both social and economic in nature, literal and metaphorical budgets. And if you want to pursue casual sex, for instance, but you live in a country where casual sex is incredibly harshly punished, like with the death penalty, as has been the case both in the present and the past in some places, this might dissuade you from trying to make your preference for casual sex a reality. There are constraints on life that are really changing the cost-benefit ratio for you for pursuing certain actions. So people have to work within these constraints, within these budgets, and select from their available options, not from all possible things. You might want to live the life of a rock star if you had the option, but you happen to work at a minimum wage job, and so you can't even afford your own space because you're priced out of it. So when life gets easier because you have more money, or because you're more attractive to others, or you're more capable and more valued, your economic and social budgets, as it were, grow. Your metaphorical budgets get higher. And with this increased budget that you have, you are now in a better position to turn your preferences into reality. So when people aren't concerned with whether they can pay their bills, this allows them to pursue other things they might enjoy. Rather than work a job they have to work at because if they don't, they can't survive. And this is likely what we're seeing with the high-earning women. Because of their expanded access to resources, they're simply in a better position to try and pursue their ideal preferences. And their standards and preferences increase when they are, for lack of a better word, allowed to. Women simply settle for less when they're less in need of a partner. Now, this general idea has been extended to a broader population as well. That is, in one study, 2008, published by Schmidt and colleagues, Schmidt being a student of David Buss, by the way, it's been reported that if you look at measures of the big five personality factors, the big five is the, the gold standard for personality measures in psychology these days. So you look at measures of the big five in men and women. How do men and women's personalities look? Across about 55 nations and 18,000 people, you do notice that there are some sex differences in personalities. Men and women do tend to differ a little bit in some of these domains. However, the size of the difference is not always the same. That is, these differences in personality, the differences between men and women, tend to be larger in societies that are more prosperous, healthier, and have a higher degree of social and gender equality. So to restate, the more people had, the more men and women were equal socially, in terms of what opportunities they could pursue and what they could do, the larger the sex differences in personality tended to be. And it seems to be the case here then that easier 
more resource-rich lives and more available options in life didn't make men and women more alike in their personality. If anything, it seemed to do the opposite. And this ties back to our broader point before about preferences. The challenges of life constrain our preferences, and when we're able to free ourselves from these constraints, the more we can turn these preferences into reality. So men and women have certain preferences. These preferences do tend to differ, as do their personalities in this case. And the easier life becomes, the easier it becomes to turn those preferences into a reality. Which is why you tend to get larger sex differences in these more prosperous, more gender equal societies. Now, if you wanted to make men and women more similar, if you wanted to reduce these sex differences and make more uniformity between sexes in the way they behave, you'd probably want to look for fairly heavy constraints that don't allow performance and personalities to diverge or from stopping them from being expressed. If you want to make men and women more alike, you have to stop them from expressing any differences rather than create context where they can express them. Though I suspect by doing so, you're probably not going to make men or women happier. And on that note, we can also look at some interesting data on professional employment to help understand more why these sex differences in personality might get larger in more prosperous, gender-equal countries. So we can look at professional employment in different careers, perhaps, over time as a measure of this preferences versus constraint issue. Some data that was presented by Stu Susan Pinker, 2008, reports that in 1973, about 50 years ago, only 5% of the lawyers in the U.S. were women. By 2003, 30 years later, this had risen from 5% to 27%. It had more than quintupled, and women were making really great strides into the field of law. During that same time, 1973 to 2003, women employed in aerospace engineering went from 1% of the field to 11% of the field. 11 times as many women. Huge increases there. And one can make very convincing arguments about why this is the case related to actual literal systems of oppression and constraint falling away. Women weren't constrained by various factors of life from entering the field of law or entering the field of engineering. And so you started seeing a lot of women getting into these fields. This is a major win. Now, over that same period, 1973, women represented about 0% of the plumbers in the U.S. By 2003, that number had skyrocketed to 1% of the plumbers in the U.S. Why was it the case, then, that women were making such great strides in entering the fields of law and entering the fields of aerospace engineering, but not really entering the world of pipes? While I can't say for certain what the nature of these differences is, my suspicion is that even when women aren't being constrained, when they're not being kept out of a field, they simply aren't as interested in rooting around in sewage as men are given their available options. It's not that women aren't capable of being plumbers, or that plumbers are in some case uniquely sexist or uniquely good at erecting barriers to female entry. It's more likely the case that women given the freedom to choose to do other things, tended to do just that. So I want to bear in mind that whenever you see a sex difference, you're not necessarily seeing someone being oppressed or someone being prevented from doing something. Sometimes a sex difference can actually be the representation of men and women being allowed to pursue the things they want to pursue, rather than being constrained from pursuing those things. So that's all I got for you now. Next time we're going to start looking at male mating preferences and long-term relationships, and then begin to see how attitudes change between these short and long-term mating contexts.